Hello, I'm Jessica Fontenot. I'm a registered nutritional therapist and nutritionist at MBANT. And today I'm going to talk to you all about everything you need to know about supporting your infant if they've had an infant dermatitis diagnosis. I'll be covering the different types of infant dermatitis and their potential triggers, things you can ask your GP because you really can ask your GP for lots of things. And of course, give some nutrition guidance. So with regards to the different types of dermatitis, the first is um, the most well known, probably cradle cap. Um, this comes up as slightly greasy, but scaly and yellow in aspect plaques on the baby's scalp. Um, and parents often worry about this because it just looks so uncomfortable. But the good news is, is that it is completely harmless and it does resolve naturally on its own quite swiftly. The second type is nappy rash, which is, as most people know, triggered by moisture and rubbing. It's basically a really bad case of chapping. Keeping that nappy area as dry as possible by changing the nappy when necessary and liberally moisturising the area can help keep this type of dermatitis at bay. Then there is contact dermatitis. Now this is a reaction when a baby's newly minted lovely soft skin encounters something that makes it trigger a reaction, such as metals. Um, you might have heard of nickel allergies. I, I acknowledge that babies don't tend to wear watches, so are less prone to that. But we can also have contact um, dermatitis through bath products or creams, washing powders, liquids, perfumes that the mum wears, um, or granny or anybody close to them. And the key is to identify what the product is that is triggering the skin reaction and keep the baby away from touching that product. I know, easier said than done. So it, my infant son had a terrible reaction to a very well-known brand of baby skincare products that I thought was going to be ideal for him. Um, and it took us a you know, trial of error wondering what was triggering this eczema until we realised that that's what it was. And as soon as we took it out, within a week, his skin had reverted to perfectly clear. So contact dermatitis can be problematic and can be quite worrying when we see it, but it also can be quite easy once we've identified the contact trigger um, to take it away from the baby and then everything's fine and then as they grow older they're able in a lot of cases to tolerate that trigger um, in future it's just because their skin is so new and shiny and just can't cope at that moment the last and most tricky um, dermatitis to manage is atopic dermatitis. So atopy basically means allergic, which is a little ironic because most people who have been diagnosed, uh, diagnosed with a, an atopic dermatitis generally have negative allergy tests. Generally, not always. Unlike contact dermatitis, the reaction can come through um, contact, but also inhalation, um, such as pollens and mold spores, which are ubiquitous in the autumn months and um, or ingesting uh, something. So foods, for example, foods and drinks. Um, other factors that can trigger or have a propensity to triggering infant dermatitis include genetics. Um, if there's a family history of dermatitis, then an infant is at much greater risk of developing the condition themselves. And I will be covering the genetics of um, atopic dermatitis specifically in a video coming up very soon. Um, but also the weather. Um, you know, soft, lovely, vulnerable skin can be really um, triggered by humidity or cold or too hot or even just the changes in temperature. So that is something to look out for, making sure that your baby skin isn't too covered, triggering a kind of heat rash, which then may develop into dermatitis if it's hot and humid, um, making sure that they are well mo moisturized in the cold months because otherwise their skin can chap, just like an adult's um, lips often chap in the winter. So if you have a GP consultation booked in, either for an initial diagnosis or for a follow-up consultation, then there are some things that you can ask. 
And I know how overwhelming it can be having a doctor's appointment with an infant. Um, they're often running late and then they spend time examining your baby um, and then give you some information and usually a piece of paper with some recommendations or a prescription. And uh, you leave the consultation and you get back to the car or even all the way back home and you suddenly think, hold on a minute, I have no idea what to do now. Um, I followed a discussion about this uh, kind of reaction um, and this overwhelm in my free Facebook group. And in response, uh, I developed a prompt sheet of questions that you can print off for free and take with you to the doctor to help you ask all the questions that you need to ask. Now, some of the questions on the list won't be appropriate immediately and, you know, and I know you will be able to see which ones will be the most useful for you, but um, it's a useful prompt sheet that you can have that will give you the ideas of the things that you can ask because you can ask for referrals and you can't, can ask for testing. So basically, in a nutshell, what you really need to know is what type of dermatitis. Is it contact? Is it atopic? Is it something else? Um, what do you need to do if the suggested creams don't help or if they did help but then the flare comes back so you know can you go back would he recommend that you would they recommend that you would go back and ask for a referral or some testing um what i would say is that if you suspect a food or environmental allergen is triggering your infant skin then it is definitely worth keeping a food and symptom diary which you can also um register record some environmental triggers in it because being able to show your GP that you have a record that points and supports your suspicions that something is triggering um, the skin issues then um, showing your GP will help him decide on the next steps and just so you know I also have a free food and symptom diary that's available via my website it's a template but please feel free to use it the more information you can go to the GP with or another nutrition practitioner, the better. So first things first, firstly, breastfeeding where possible. If you have a family history of dermatitis, then the recommendation is that um, your infant will be breastfed for at least the first six months of life. And that is to try and support the reduction of risk that your infant will develop um, dermatitis absolutely aware that not everybody can breastfeed um, and if you are moving on to formula and you have a family history of dermatitis then my recommendation would be to go and talk to your health visitor or your GP or even a nutrition professional and ask for good recommendations of hypoallergenic formula or alternatives. This is to try and reduce the risk of your infant developing the infant dermatitis. When it comes to weaning, there are three different scenarios which I've put here in this very simple um, mind map. So your infant has no dermatitis diagnosis, skin is still beautifully soft and clear, and has no family history of dermatitis, everything's good so far, then the recommendation is to wean at six months or when the child can sit up unsupported in a high chair and starts to be interested in the food around him. Basically, if his fingers start to creep or his or her fingers start to creep across the table to pinch your toast, then we're probably ready for weaning. Weaning foods should include a really good variety and I'm gonna come on to that in a minute. But that variety should include common allergen foods such as dairy or egg or peanut. If your infant has no dermatitis diagnosis, so once again, skin completely clear, but does have a family history of atopia or dermatitis, then the recommendations are slightly different. It's recommended that weaning is brought forward um, to four months. So no, they may not be able to absolutely sit up unsupported, um, but they should be given, obviously, adapted, pureed forms of foods, a good variety once again, and still, yes, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but still including common allergens. And the reason for this is because whilst the gut is still very immature, studies have shown that introducing those potential allergens earlier rather than later gives that gut a chance to get used to it, for the immune system to not identify it as something bad, 
And so um, less reaction, uh, less possibility or risk of having a reaction. So infant, no dermatitis diagnosis and no family of atopy, six months, no dermatitis diagnosis and yes, family of atopy and dermatitis weaning at four months in both scenarios, lots of variety and make sure you have the allergenic foods introduced quite early on. Third scenario, infant pre-weaning has already had a dermatitis diagnosis and by this I do not mean either cradle cap or nappy rash I mean the contact or more um, more particularly the atopic dermatitis diagnosis so the recommendation then is to do the weaning when they're sitting up unsupported but also to be cautious with the introducing of the commonly allergenic foods I don't mean avoid them but just be cautious and be a lot more aware and monitor potential symptoms. Uh, if you have any doubts or are unsure, then the best thing to do is to talk to your health visitor or talk to a nutritional professional or a me medical professional, your GP, for example. So going further on to nutrition, once the weaning has really kick-started and you're maybe even beyond the puree stage, what would I recommend? So I'm always at risk of repeating myself, but variety is absolutely key. Habituating an infant to a range of tastes and textures and variety is what will help not only develop their palate, but also how the gut matures and develops. Our gut microbiome absolutely loves fibre. So introducing foods that are a good source of fibre, such as vegetables and fruit and whole grains, are absolutely key to help feed the, gut, um, the infant gut microbiome. They're still, you know, their own natural but still developing population of healthy gut bacteria. Probiotics. Most of us have heard of probiotics nowadays. These are the good bacteria we can eat to supplement our own natural population. And we can have them supplements, but we can also find them in foods. And I'm always uh, recommend somebody who recommends a food first basis. So good food sources include natural yogurt. Um, always look for ones with live cultures or fermented foods. Now I know that fermented foods such as pickles or sauerkraut aren't often an infant's first choice, but giving them a little amount on their plate which they can pick and touch and, and play with at the start um, encourages them to taste them and can also help them get used to the taste and texture. I know that by the time my daughter was on finger foods, she absolutely loved pickled cucumbers, especially the ones you can get in France, the cornichon. Um, and I would actually have to move the jar away from the table because um, otherwise she would just carry on eating them and I, you know, too much is too much. Um, so as I was saying, our gut bacteria need to be fed. So we've just talked about how we can introduce new gut bacteria into the gut, um, but those gut bacteria in the natural population actually need food to thrive. And that food is generally thought of as prebiotics. And those are foods including onions and garlic and Jerusalem artichokes. Jerusalem artichokes look very strange and knobbly and are not that easy to peel. I give you that, but they taste just like a delicious artichoke heart. And they're absolutely gorgeous, pureed or roasted. So once past the puree stage, um, you know, if you include a small portion of different foods on an infant's plate, this, as I mentioned a minute ago, it encourages exploration and being adventurous with food. Um, even now with my family, and my kids are now quite quite a bit bigger, um, I cook slightly larger portions of different vegetables so that I can include some of the leftovers in different meals throughout the week. This helps me give the daily variety but without having to cook too many different things at each separate meal. And moving on from that, you often hear the term eat a rainbow nowadays, and that's because it's absolutely true including different colours on a plate or throughout the day, um, provides different nutrients. Each of those colours give different foods that are needed within our body to give the vitamins and minerals that not only build our body, but also help uh, fuel the processes that our body um, undertakes. Um, my thoughts on frozen, tinned and fresh, um, I think they're all fine. 
I think it's everything is always a scale and you need to do the best thing that you can do in the moment that you can do it. Uh, my only uh, thing that I would say about tin food is I would probably give them a bit of a rinse um, because they are often uh, have added salt and sugar to them. So if you're using tin food, give them a bit of a rinse. Frozen food, fantastic. If you've got a freezer big enough to put them in, wonderful. Um, if you can do fresh, great. Um, I often freeze some fresh foods that I have left over so I can have some kind of summery foods um, in the winter, but I am very fortunate and I have enough room for quite a large freezer. So I do that a lot. Um, with regards to specific foods that are good for general skin health, um, vitamin C is um, absolutely vital for collagen. That helps keep, for those of us who are beyond the infant stage, it helps keep our skin nice and uh, bouncy. Um, and I know the first thing that most people think of uh, for vitamin C are citrus fruits, but lots of fruits and vegetables have really good levels of vitamin C. I'm always somebody to promote more vegetables than fruit. And I would say, you know, good sources, including things like peppers and broccoli. Vitamin E is also really important for skin protection and repair and vitamin E food sources can be found in things like extra virgin olive oil. Um, I sometimes use that to kind of drizzle on some vegetables just at the very end of the cooking time or just before serving but also can be found in things like nuts and seeds. Now clearly if your um, infant has a uh, atopic or allergic terrain then you know nuts might have to be approached with caution but as we discussed um, a little bit earlier I'm hoping that if that terrain is there then you're being supported by a medical practitioner or a nutrition professional. Omega-3s essential fatty acids most of us have heard about them nowadays most of them uh, most of us think of them in supplement form but you know we can find them in oily fish and a little bit of sardine on toast is uh, mixed with maybe a little bit of cream cheese to soften it um, is a really good toddler food on uh, toast fingers um, if you are more plant-based, then you can find omega-3 sources in chia seeds, nice little chia seed pudding, or ground flax seeds that you can add to a porridge. Um, zinc. Zinc is absolutely essential for repair. Really great um, new, uh, mineral when we're talking about atopic dermatitis. And zinc is found primarily in its largest sources um, in meat or animal-based foods such as meat and eggs, um, but it can also be found in seeds such as pumpkin seeds. So it isn't impossible to find them in food base and we don't need to always supplement. Um, the last is vitamin D, an essential vitamin or slash really hormone in every way. So government guidelines are that infants should have vitamin D supplementation from birth to 12 months. So if your GP hasn't mentioned this, go back and have a discussion with them about it. But the best source of vitamin D remains sunlight and taking your infant out for a short walk in the daylight not only helps with vitamin D levels, but can also help their circadian rhythms, which is basically the times, the, the internal clock that keeps us going throughout the day. And that is great for wake and sleep times, which as we all know, is absolutely essential when we have infants. So I wanted to cover um, elimination diets. Many carers of infants diagnosed with dermatitis come to me having already started um, eliminating diets from either their own because they're still breastfeeding or their infant's diet. And I would like to really make this really clear. Unless you have an IgE allergy diagnosis, this is not a good idea. Um, a diagnosis or a suspicion of an allergy that's being investigated by a GP or an allergy specialist. So yes, removing the food at the beginning appears to make things better, but this is a false hope. What usually happens is that when the food is reintroduced, um, future reactions are much, much worse and can even develop into anaphylaxis, which requires um, medical treatment or even hospitalization. So when I say don't start eliminating foods unless you have a really good medically or nutrition practitioner based reason for uh, avoiding those foods, then don't, please don't. 
Um, the other thing that happens is the gut um, is a pesky little thing and it decides after a bit that it felt a lot better when you eliminated that food but now it's going to start deciding to react to something else and um, what happens is that then that food uh, gets taken out and you end up um, restricting bit by bit the diet until it can become very restricted and in my clinic, I work with a lot of infants and young children who have, um, by process of elimination, ended up with between five and ten foods that they can eat. And it is not sustainable and it does not allow children to thrive um, and it can be really dangerous. So my recommendation is that you go and see your GP and you discuss it. So nutrition practitioners and medical doctors do sometimes use um elimination diets but that really is in a controlled manner and for short-term bursts um we'll never remove a food that we don't absolutely have a need to remove and it will always be short term and there will always be a process of um, monitored and controlled reintroduction that happens um, very soon afterwards my priority and my aim is always to ensure that um, children have the most varied diet that they can possibly have so they get the balance of nutrients that they need and they can really really thrive um keep that food and symptom diary the one i keep mentioning uh, and there will be a link to the free version that i have which is just a template and it gives you an idea of the kind of useful information you should include um it will be probably in the show notes or it'll be you can get it via my website um, use that information to give to a medical or nutrition professional who can help you navigate the right way of eating for that individual infant or child. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say on this topic is sometimes an immature gut can just start rejecting a food that comes around too often. So consider, instead of eliminating food, consider rotating foods and ingredients so that your infant isn't having the same one two days in a row and that often can make a difference. So I just wanted to finish this um, video with a quick recap and some top tips. So my first recommendation is consult your GP, health visitor or nutritional professional before making any changes to your infant's diet, especially as we just mentioned, if you're considering eliminations. Variety is absolutely key. A good mix of colourful vegetables, fruit and good fibre are absolutely necessary for your child to thrive. Sometimes an immature gut can start to reject a food that simply comes around too often. So consider rotating foods and ingredients so that your infant isn't having the same ones two days in a row. Use a food and symptom diary to keep track. I know I keep repeating that one. Um, don't forget there's the GPE prompt sheet so that you don't forget to ask questions when you're in a consultation. Feel free to use that. And if you're thinking about introducing no foods but you're a little bit cautious and a little bit wary, introduce them slowly and one food at a time in small quantities. So start with a food, in, let's say a teaspoon of the food, and over time increase that till you get up to about a couple of tablespoons. And only introduce a new food one at a time so that you can use that food and symptom diary that I keep repeating um, to monitor whether in the end there was a reaction. If there wasn't a reaction at one or two teaspoons but there was a reaction at two tablespoons instead of eliminating it completely just go back a notch start go back to the two teaspoons that were fine and let that settle and let the gut get used to it a little bit more i really hope that this um a video on the on infant dermatitis and how to manage it has been useful to you. Um, if you have any questions or want other topics covered, then please put um, those in the comment box below. And also, if you enjoy the video, then please give it a like. And if you want more um, material, then please consider subscribing. I hope to see you again very soon. Take care.